Rise in hate crime suggests there's a darker, less palatable side to the way Britain treats people with disabilities. Tonight, disabled actress and comedian Francesca Martinez investigates this apparent increase in resentment towards some of the most vulnerable in our society. In a few days, we'll be celebrating the sporting endeavour and achievement of more than 4,000 disabled athletes. But away from the Olympic Park, it seems there is a different, less charitable attitude towards people with disabilities, because last year there were an estimated 65,000 cases of disability hate crime. Charities put that figure closer to 100,000. I'm Francesca Martinez and I'm wobbly. I have cerebral palsy, but I do prefer the word wobbly because um, it's a lot cooler and a lot easier to say. Please show me the wonderful Francesca Martinez! As a wobbly person, I've experienced negative attitudes and I'm really passionate about trying to change those attitudes. Anyone can become disabled at any time, so I feel it's a really important issue. In a recent report, nearly half of the disabled people surveyed said that attitude towards them over the last year had worsened. And 66% had experienced aggression, hostility and verbal abuse. Francesco wanted to find out more about the nature of these attacks and why they appear to be on the increase. To learn more, she's heading to the northeast. We're in a cab on the way to meet Peter Greener, who lives in South Shields. And Peter was a victim of hate crime last year. Peter Greener has worked for most of his adult life, but four years ago he developed nerve damage to the brain and was forced to give up his job and rely on benefits. Peter's condition fluctuates. Some days he needs his wheelchair, at other times he can use his crutches. His neighbour thought he was exaggerating his condition and started to video him whenever he wasn't using his wheelchair. Peter was stunned. We didn't know nothing at first until a neighbour told us that she seen some videos of me cutting me grass because he used to video us. Why was he videoing you? He thought I was fake. He's called me a spacker, a cripple. I'm a benefit cheat, I'm a scrounger. The abuse started to escalate and in desperation the Greeners contacted the police who advised them to install a CCTV camera. He's throwing eggs at the windows, throwing stones at the windows, shouting abuse all the time. Even when we're being down to a local shopping centre, he shouted that we're scum. He's spray painted pay off low life all over a fence. Three months after the abuse began, Peter's neighbour, David McGregor, was arrested and charged. In court, he pleaded guilty to harassment and criminal damage. Because of the disability hate aspect of the case, he received a 10-week suspended sentence and a restraining order. But for Peter and his family, the effects have been devastating. With all the stress, when he was putting this under, I had a small heart attack in the house. How did you feel when the case went to court? Before it went to court, I thought about committing suicide a few times because I thought that was the only way this was going to stop. Because I was sick and I was hurt knowing that my two kids were suffering themselves. But if it wasn't for my wife, I would have probably have tried to do that. She managed to persuade me to go through with it all and take him to court. To hear 
of such extreme bullying. And that's what it is, it's bullying. It's really shocking. Part of me is really angry. I'm angry on their behalf. And I, I just, I can't imagine what it must be like to go through that or see a family member go through that. I would be absolutely seething if someone I loved was treated that way. Although there were an estimated 65,000 disability hate crimes last year, only 2,000 were reported, and just over 500 resulted in a conviction. Francesca wanted to know what was fueling this hostility. Journalist Catherine Quarmby began investigating this sort of crime five years ago, when the case of Kevin Davies hit the headlines. I then started to gather together other cases, very similar cases that seemed to suggest there was a depth of hatred towards disabled people in the UK that had gone almost completely unrecognised by police, prosecutors and the media. Verbal and physical attacks against the disabled have doubled since 2008. Catherine is concerned that headlines like these have led to an assumption that many people with disabilities are in fact benefit cheats. We know quite a lot about the way in which the media reports disability and the scrounger rhetoric that has kind of started to increase recently. The incidence of words such as scrounger, skyver, cheat and so on has tripled in the last five years. A study earlier this year suggested that the public believes that on average 50 to 70 per cent of people claiming disability benefits are cheating the system. According to the government's own figures, the actual rate is just 0.5%. It's remarkably ignorant of disability when you think, you know, how many disabling conditions there are that are invisible to the eye. So, for instance, mental health conditions, autism and so on. An ordinary neighbour does not have that in-depth knowledge of disability and cannot in any way be qualified to decide whether their neighbour is disabled or not. Disability fraudsters have been high profile and widely reported. Most support the crackdown on cheats and need for welfare reform, but there are concerns that headlines like these, combined with the government's anti-scrounger rhetoric, is fueling resentment to the genuinely disabled. Unfortunately, a lot of the consequences of welfare reform haven't really been thought through. And we believe the government is driving its reform agenda based on issues such as a very small minority of, of benefits, cheats and scroungers. Campaigners say the real truth is that most people with disabilities want to work, but that's not easy in a world that often discriminates against them. Rather than looking at the huge numbers of disabled people and the, the real support that they need, the fact that most of them want to be working, they want to be active in society, uh, and what we should be about in, in, in Britain in, in 2012 is having a, a welfare state that ensures that, that people can do that. This is 32-year-old Tony Collins, proudly carrying the Olympic torch through his hometown of Barking in Essex. Tony and brother Neil both have learning difficulties and both are keen runners who have represented the country across the globe. Tony at first struggled to find a job he was happy in because of bullying and abuse in the workplace. But for the last 13 years, he has worked for Remploy, government-funded factories set up in 1945. They were a founding element of the welfare state. 2,400 disabled workers are employed across the country. Tony's been working at Remploy for 13 years and most of that time he's um, worked on recycling of computers for resale. Um, absolutely loves going to work. He's up at five o'clock in the shower singing his heart out every morning. But in just five months' time, Tony and 1,421 Remploy workers across the country will be out of a job. Would we want? Yeah. Would we want? Yeah. Maria Mia. Yeah. Maria Mia. Earlier this year, Minister for Disabled People Maria Miller announced that 27 of the 54 factories were to close by the end of 2012. Would we want? Yeah. 
will we wear it now? I dread Tony's last day at Remploy. Tony just wants to work and when he's finally not going to be able to go to work, I just don't know what he's going, what he's going to do. I really, really don't. I, I honestly fear for him and, and for us. It's, uh, it's going to affect our family and loads of other families in really, really badly. I'm absolutely positive of that. Don't really want to live on benefits. We really want to have a job to go to, like Rambo, so I don't have to live on no benefits. Do you think you'll be able to get another job? No, not really, no. Because not even normal people are getting a job. There's normal people out there who are not getting it. So I've probably got no chance. Tony is worried he may face more bullying when he's forced to find another job. Tony is fearful of finding work outside Remploy because he actually fears walking into mainstream employment and there can't be anything worse than having to get up every morning being fearful of actually going to work. We won't be sheltered no more though, we'll be in the wild open world. Are you worried about other people that you'll work with? Yeah. And what worries you about that? In case they bully you, I don't know, in case they bully you. This world is not ready for people with disabilities. It's sad, but it's true. They are not ready for them. And until people start being respectful to people with disabilities and treating them like human beings, like they are, it'll never be right. The government says the factories are not financially viable and employment should be inclusive and not segregated. But with the country in recession and unemployment figures topping 2.5 million, these workers fear for their employment future. I think I'll find it very hard because uh, there's already millions of people unemployed. Why should a uh, outside employer choose me? What prospects? There ain't none. If this place closes, that'll be the end of their working life and they'll spend the rest of their days claiming benefits and be, being labelled scroungers. Francesca wanted to talk to the government about whether some of the rhetoric around their policies is having an impact on current attitudes towards the disabled. I'm outside the Department of Work and Pensions. A few weeks ago I asked for an interview with Maria Miller, the Minister for Disabled People. Unfortunately, she declined despite the fact we only asked for 15 minutes of our time. I really wanted to talk to her about the rise in hate crime and the link between media perception and hardening attitudes. Instead, she gave us this statement. Disability hate crime in all its forms is intolerable. We are developing a new disability strategy promoting positive attitudes and behaviours towards disabled people. We know that most claimants are honest, but have a responsibility to tackle those who are not. For adults with learning difficulties, life can be especially hard. Nine out of ten have experienced harassment and bullying. The tragic case of Fiona Pilkington hit the headlines in 2007, after she killed herself and her severely disabled daughter. Fiona Pilkington and her daughter Francesca suffered a decade-long campaign of abuse by local youths. Extreme incidents like this one are rare and shocking. Some of the most disturbing cases have involved people with learning disabilities being abused by people they trusted. It's known as mate crime. Mate crime is a kind of subset of, of disability hate crime and it seems to be very specifically something that happens to some groups of disabled people, almost all of whom have learning disabilities. And what seems to happen is that because of this problem of loneliness, um, they then look for any friends that they could possibly find. And so at the beginning, they're flattered by the attention quite often and will sometimes put up with really quite high degrees of violence. Gemma Hayter was a happy, trusting 27-year-old with learning difficulties. Two years ago, she was brutally murdered by people she considered her friends. Francesca is on her way to meet Gemma's mum, Sue, and older sister, Nikki. 
looking back, are there any memories that you think about that make you smile? Smile sometimes for the wrong reasons, though, because the things that she would get up to, you knew weren't conventional, so you shouldn't find them amusing, but they really were. She never stopped saying, I love you, Mummy, I love you, Nikki. Very affectionate. She'd always want kisses and hugs and, you know. Yeah. Gemma didn't recognise her own vulnerabilities and was determined to lead an independent life. She lived alone in a flat in Rugby, a few miles from her family. Here she met 21-year-old Chantel Booth. It was wonderful that Gemma had a friend. Yeah. It's not a friend we'd have chosen for her, but Gemma had never had anybody outside the family want to spend time, time with her. For Gemma, that friendship was to come at the highest price. On the 8th of August 2010, she was spending the evening with Chantelle and four of her friends. What we know about that night is Gemma went to visit Chantelle Booth at her flat in Rugby. Um, the other four defendants were, were present, um, drinking and smoking cannabis. Uh, and for an unknown reason, they subjected Gemma to, to an assault. Uh, she was assaulted. Um, around the face, she was hit with a mop. Um, a number of the group made a drink from a can of a lager which contained urine um, and generally subjected to a, a vicious, violent, unprovoked attack over a, a number of hours. The five then left the flat telling Gemma they were taking her home. But instead, they began a 30-minute walk. CCTV footage shows the group and the last moments of Gemma's life. And you actually see Gemma wiping her nose, which has obviously got blood coming from it. And she follows the group who are effectively taking her to her death. How did you feel when you saw the CCTV footage of Gemma walking with them? We know now what was going on, we know what was done, we know what she must have been thinking and what she must have been feeling. She was even dying then because of the damage done to her beforehand. Gemma is so naive that no matter what they did, she probably thought, that's it now. She probably did think she was going home. The group take her to a disused railway line outside of Rugby, uh, where again she's subjected to another assault. Uh, the clothes she's wearing are taken from her, set fire to. Uh, and the group leave her for dead and it's quite eerie when you look at the CCTV footage of the group returning minus Gemma still laughing and joking as if they haven't got a care in the world that they've left their so-called friend Gemma dead. Gemma sustained more than 50 injuries in the attacks. Her body was discovered the next morning. Within days the five were arrested and charged. Nikki, how did you feel when you heard the news about Gemma from me, your mum? The worst thing for me is knowing that my mum has had to do it. You know, my, when we went to the morgue. Mm. <laughs> right, it's over with. But when we went to the morgue, I think I had to watch my mum. It's her daughter, it's her baby daughter. I had to watch her go through everything and my nan, I had to see my nan, know that my nan had seen my, my sister dead. And every time we do anything like this, I know that the only reason we're doing it is not because she, she died because she was poorly or she was hit by a car or anything like that, it's because of the way that she was killed and because I know what they did. It's the way Gemma died. It's because she had a learning disability. I am quite sure if Gemma had been normal, then if, if she'd have been mainstream, I suppose... It wouldn't have days, happened. It wouldn't have happened. Three of the group were convicted of murder, including Chantelle Booth, and two with manslaughter. All received sentences of between 13 and 21 years. Mm -hmm. 
Today is the second anniversary of Gemma's murder by the people she thought were her friends. Mum Sue and sister Nikki lay flowers at the place she died. That was really hard. I feel so angry that Sue and Nikki had to go through that and that Gemma was treated like that. So sad that just because someone's different, they're treated like an animal. For me, mate crime is hate crime and will be dealt with in the same way. We need to know about it um, so we can actually deal with it you know, properly and sensitively according to the, the victim's needs. Mate crime doesn't often result in violence and murder, but it often forms a results in other forms of abuse, which can include cruelty. So the extreme cases, such as the Gemma Hater case, uh, there have been a number of other very high profile murders, are few and far between. Physical abuse is rare but not unknown. Financial, emotional abuse uh, is much more common. Next week, the country will once again join together in support and admiration of our sporting Paralympian heroes. But the hope is that the true legacy of these games will be a positive change in the way we view the disabled in our society. We've got such a fantastic opportunity with the Paralympics to think differently about disability, but let's not use it just as, a, as an opportunity to, to think about Paralympic sporting heroes. Let's think about the issues that ordinary disabled people face every day. A lot of disabled people experience a lot of prejudice and discrimination every day. This is totally unacceptable. I'm proud to be wobbly. It's taught me great things and it's made me much more understanding to others. We never hear about the positives to being different. I hope that we can learn to strip away this label of disability and just see and respect people in all their differences. Some of Britain's leading Paralympians have predicted that public attitudes towards disability will be transformed by the Games, which get underway next Wednesday. Now, if you'd like more information on tonight's programme, please visit our website at itv.com tonight. But for now, good evening and thanks for watching.